Hi guys, how are you guys doing? Hope you guys are doing great. Um, now we're going to start with our next topic of pharmacology is the drug distribution. Um, in my previous videos, we studied about the different branches of pharmacology and followed by the sources from where we can get these drugs. Now we're studying the drug distribution, which means that now you have taken in that drug and it has come into my like bloodstream. It's now in my blood. Now how from that blood it is going to go to my brain, to my kidneys, to my liver, to my hands, to my feet. That all is going to deal with drug distribution. First of all, you all should know what drug distribution is, right? If you don't understand that, how are you going to understand the rest? So it is very simple. Um, for example, I take a pill, a medicine, right? I take that medicine orally. I swallow it. It goes into my bloodstream. Now from that bloodstream, it has to go to my brain. Right. I like, for example, I have a headache, so I take a medicine that is required for my headache. Right. So how that blood, that drug will leave the blood and go to the brain to perform its function. That whole is called as distribution of drug. Now, this distribution of drug from my blood, leaving the blood to go to the organs, different organs to perform its action. That is distribution of drug and it consists of different factor first is the cardiac output and the blood flow second is capillary permeability third is tissue volume fourth is binding of that drug with my plasma and tissue protein and fifth is your lipids like lipohypolicity means lipid soluble its nature so these are the five factors on which the drug is going to depend and it is on these factors whether my drug will be able to distribute or will not be able to distribute now we're going to study one by one each of these factors first factor is the blood flow right now obviously we all know that blood is very essential for us right so there are different organs of our body which require a lot of blood flow and there are certain organs of our body which require a few or less amount of blood. So first of all, let's divide those organs into high blood depending organs and low blood depending organs. So those organs which are high blood depending organs and low. The high ones are the most important, brain my liver, my kidneys. So these are the three which require blood and they are having a high blood flow. So let's deal right now with them. So I've taken my medicine. Medicine is in my body. Now these organs have a high blood flow. So what do you think? When my blood will, drug will come, there will be blood. Now the blood is more and more here. So obviously the blood will take the drug more quickly to my brain, to my liver, and to my kidney. As a result, its function will be quick and more, right? So its distribution will be more quickly as compared to others. Now we study that the organs which didn't need so much blood, the low ones. Those are my adipose tissues, my skeletal muscles, and my skin. So if they require something like a medicine, then the blood will be like very slow and low. So the drug will then go very slow and slow and slow to these skeletal muscles, to my skin, to my adipose tissues, right? So that was the relation of distribution with blood flow. Now, for example, you're giving a drug to that patient and the patient's drug affects the brain, right? We study that the brain consists of very fast blood flow. So obviously the distribution will be very quick. So like, for example, when you have to do an operation, you have to make that person anesthetic or means like unconsciously aware about what's happening. What are you going to do? You are going to give the medicine to that patient and the blood supply to your brain is very quick. So the distribution of drug to that brain will be very quick and as a result, the patient will go in anesthetic effect. Now, if that same drug will have to affect my muscles, my skin, then it will start to go away from the brain and will be distributed to these areas of the limb. 
So its concentration in the brain will start to decrease and dip. And while it will start to decrease and decrease, the patient will start to come more and more conscious. Like in normal life, they say that when you take a medicine, wait till its effect cuts down. And when it cuts down, you become more and more aware of what's happening. So that was the relation of blood flow with distribution. Second is capillary permeability, which you will understand very well by looking at the diagram, which I'm going to show to you. First, what is capillary permeability? It is depending on two factors. First is your capillary structure. And number two is the nature, chemical nature of that drug. Now, for example, we have our liver and we're going to have our spleen. That is this figure. Look at this figure, first of all, this one. Here you can see that your basement membrane is discontinuous. You can see there are certain areas where there's a lot of gap junction, certain where there's very few gap junction, right? So this will indicate that your um, gap junctions, which are the spaces present between the endothelial membranes, are discontinuous. So like, for example, if I make these, let me take this. So these here and like this has a low gap junction and this has a very big gap junctions, right? So from this means that first thing, basement membrane discontinuous. Second, large, not small, large, large plasma proteins, they can pass through that basement membrane and perform their effect. And in which organs? In our liver and spleen. Second, brain. In brain, these basement membranes, these endothelial slit junctions, there are no junctions present between the capillary. So in the brain, these capillary, for example, this is a cap. All of them, they are tightly packed like this. So there is no junction through which the drug can pass through and enter into the brain. So how do drugs then go into the brain? Hmm. Answer to this question is they have to diffuse through that membrane to enter into the brain by means if they are lipid solid. Second, they can also go by active transport. So if our drug we take in, if they have to go into the brain, they have to be lipid soluble to diffuse into the basement membrane and enter into the brain, or they can undergo active transport. And if they're not lipid soluble, they're water soluble, then they cannot pass through it and they cannot affect the and these tightly packed cells in the basement membrane, which are closely packed to one, those are called as gap junctions. So that was the second, that was the capillary permeability. Third, binding of plasma proteins and tissue proteins with the drug. So if I take a drug, inhale it, take it in, and from the brain, it has to go from, sorry, from not the brain, from the blood, it has to go to different parts, right? From, from here to here. Like. So for example, if I have a drug here and it has to go and affect my heart. So if that drug is going to bind very tightly with my cardiac tissue, it is going to remain tightly to it and cannot be excreted. So its effect will be more. Till it is remaining attached to it, it will function. And my it will uh, function more and more till it breaks. Uh, like for example, you guys have a headache, right? Now I take a medicine to cure that headache. Now that medicine will bind to my head's tissues, my brain tissues, my meninge, and bind to them as long as my headache doesn't finish. And once it finished, then it's going to separate and be excreted out and as result, I'll be fine. Right? So those drugs will have more effects and they will have a more greater half-life. For example, like you have may seen in patients when a doctor says that there are certain medicines you have to take two times a day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And there are certain drugs which he says that only one time in a whole day. Why? Because those drugs which he has to take only one time in a day, they just will bind to that protein as long as it doesn't decrease its effect. Where there are certain drugs, which we'll study in detail later on, that will remain bind to it for a short time and then separate. So its effect will decrease more quickly as compared to one which remains tightly attached to it for a longer time. Then we have the fourth factors, that is the lipophilicity. Means that the ones which are more lipid soluble, 
and they uh, can pass through the brain barrier, they can pass through your uh, basement membrane, they will cause your effects more as compared to ones which are not lipid soluble. Then we have volume of distribution. Like we just studied that we have a drug that comes in, goes into my blood, and then goes to a different organ. Now, if you want to calculate how much of that blood is going or that drug is going from my blood to my different organs, what is the formula? The method to calculate it is called volume of distribution, which is equals to the total concentration of that drug. Total, like if I take a one gram of that drug, that's the one gram. And then how much of that concentration of drug is present in my blood? So if like, for example, it's 0 0.5, so one by 0 0.5. So whatever will be the ratio that will determine the volume of this, that this much of this specific drug is distributed to different parts from the blood. That is volume of distribution. Now there are three compartments of it. Plasma compartment, interstitial compartments and into your extracellular fluid compartments. Number one, plasma compartment. Those drugs which have high molecular weight, so their molecular weight is high, but they remain tightly bind to plasma proteins. They cannot leave the plasma. Like if this is plasma protein and this is a drug, so this drug will bind to that plasma protein and cannot leave it to leave the plasma and enter into the interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. Those drugs are called plasma proteins, for example, your heparin drug. Second is the extracellular fluid. The drugs which have a low molecular weight, they do not remain tightly bind with plasma protein. They can pass through that endothelial basement membrane. They can enter into the interstitial fluid, but not in the cells, only in the fluid they are present. Those are called as the extracellular fluid drugs. For example, your aminoglycanes, all your antibiotics. Third is your uh, intracellular fluid, which have a low molecular weight. They are lipophilic, means lipid soluble and water hating. They can pass through the endothelial basement membrane and they can perform their actions. Those are, for example, ethanol. Those are your intracellular fluid. So those were the three compartments. Now, the half-life of drug, which is very, very important. The half-life of drug is, as I said, you take in a drug. And if that drug remains tightly bind to your plasma proteins or tissue protein or to any tissue of kidneys, liver, heart, if remains it for a long period of time, half-life will be more and its effect will be more and its rate of excretion will be less and will be later on. Whereas drugs, which do not remain tightly bind to your tissue organs or plasma protein, they will have decreased effect and their excretion will be more and they will have to be taken repetitively or within short after short intervals of time to perform their action. So, more tightly bind to plasma proteins, more half-life. More will be its effect, less will be its excretion. Less tightly bounded to plasma proteins, less will be its effect, less will be its distribution, more will be its excretion. So that was all for distribution of drugs and hope this helped you guys in understanding it. And if you like my video, do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you guys have any questions, leave it in the comment box and I'll answer it. Thank you.